Hi there, and welcome to The Artist Craft. I am your host, Stacey Cochran, and we have an outstanding guest with us at Quail Ridge Books today. I am thrilled to be interviewing Ron Rash. Ron is the author of Serena, One Foot in Eden, Saints at the River, and The World Made Straight. He is the Paris Distinguished Professor in Appalachian Cultural Studies at Western Carolina University, and his latest novel, Serena, was a 2009 finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award. Thank you very much for doing this interview today. Uh, glad to be here. Well, I want to get into talking a little bit about Serena first, since that's, that's the, the current novel. Uh, what challenges, what, what were some of the challenges in writing a historically accurate novel? Well, I, I think the, the, the hardest thing is getting the time right, and not just the time, but the sensibility. I think sometimes the danger with historical fiction is that the writer brings a you know, 2009 sensibility into uh, a 19th, you know, or, you know, a, a, a century before, and that I think is a problem as well. But a lot of it was just trying to get uh, the small details right, and I was actually very fortunate in that I was able to find some loggers who had logged in the Smokies in the 1930s, and that was very helpful as far as getting period details. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of research? You mentioned a couple of things there, looking at, at some of the the loggers, that, one of the things I'm struck with in a novel is just how accurate a lot of the details are. Uh, and, you know, one of the nice things about that as a reader is uh, you're never really taken out of the story. You're completely immersed in the story. How important is that authenticity for you as a writer to, to make sure the details are perfect? Well, that's the challenge, and I think as a reader myself, I know that you're exactly right. I think when uh, there is something wrong, you get the wrong kind of fish for this water, those kinds of things, that, that can pull a reader out. And so the challenge is to do the best job you can. Uh, I've, I've learned that uh, as a writer, I'll always miss something, but you've got to make as few errors as possible. And, and I think it, uh, one thing that I found very interesting about writing novels set in the past and, and also novel set in the present is the fact that very often though people read fiction knowing it's fiction, they love to learn about true things. Uh -huh. Very cool. One of the things that's, that's most interesting to me about Serena is the question of who we're supposed to pull for in the novel. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges of uh, writing Pemberton and, and, and Serena and trying to create reader sympathy for for characters like Pemberton right. and Serena. Right. Well, that was the that was the risk of the novel, in, in the sense that so many of the characters in the novel are unsympathetic. Uh, I did hope, however, that Serena, particularly, even though she's evil, mm -hmm. uh, she's also charismatic. I mean, there is something that draws us to her, and uh, one thing that I, that I think very often appeals to us about certain villains, I think of Shigur in uh, No Country for Old Men, uh, is that the, the, the characters haven't perhaps warped, but nevertheless uh, a sense of integrity. Uh, they have their own codes, and I think that's true of Serena. I think that, that she has an integrity about her. How conscious of, of that were you as you were writing it? You had to know that you were writing you know, kind of unsavory characters, mm. but they're larger than life. Yeah. And, you know, the first chapter works very well to draw mm. the reader in to sympathizing with right. Pemberton, which is right. brilliant, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you find out, you know, what he's all about later right. on in the book. Right. How conscious of you are kind of walking that line of, okay, these characters, ultimately their ambitions, you know, are sort of their undoing, right. but making the reader interested in them. Yeah. That seems like a tough thing to do. Well, it is, and I think it's up to the reader to decide whether I did it successfully. Uh, at, but I think part of it's just making uh, the reader have a sense of perhaps a slower realization what these characters are really about. I mean, I, I hope in some ways perhaps Serena, early on, there, there's something admirable about this strong woman who doesn't refuses to be condescended to by men, and then as we get deeper into the book, we realize that there's, there's more going on there. And the other thing I hoped is that uh, even though Serena and Pemberton dominate the book in many ways, that there are characters, particularly Rachel, the, the sheriff, um, who uh, are, are characters that the reader can identify with, uh, can sympathize with, and also, in a sense, I guess, cheer for. When you start a novel, do you start with the first chapter and work through linearly, or talk about your writing yeah. process? I, I, n I never do that. I never outline. Uh, every every uh, 
novel I've written has begun with a single image. And in Serene, it was an image of a woman on horseback, a very strong, haughty woman, a woman I knew was capable of dominating not only fellow human beings, but also a landscape. So did you, like, was the first scene a chapter of her on horseback, and then did you have to go back and figure out where that fits into the novel? Right. Well, it, it, it's actually the scene ends up being almost at the center of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I, I it's, it's triggered a series of questions. I mean, who is she? Why is she here? Who's, and, and the, the crucial question, I think, for the novel, the linchpin of the novel is who is observing her? Who sees her on this summit? and sees her with a mixture of awe, mm -hmm. fear, and, and love. And that's, of course, Pemberton. Mm. Which is more important to you as a writer, setting or character? I see those, I, well, I have a line that I used in, in The World Made Straight um, uh, where I say that, you know, landscape is destiny. And so to me, it's, mm -hmm. it's a merger. And very often I like to think of, the, the, of those things mm -hmm. coming together. At what point in your writing process for a novel does plot become dominant, if ever? Well, as, as I go through the drafts, I start to realize more what the story is. Mm -hmm. And and to me, it's, it's, it's hit and miss. I mean, I probably, first draft of Serena was probably 170 pages. It ends up being almost 400 pages. I cut probably 150 pages where I thought the plot was going, you know, the, the story was going one way. Uh, to me, it's just a matter of just letting the, the plot unfold through the drafts and, and find out which directions are best. What influence, if any, does John Steinbeck and Cormac McCarthy, who you mentioned a moment ago, uh, what, what influence, if any, does Steinbeck and McCarthy's work play in your writing? Well, I read Steinbeck when I was very young. I started reading him when I was in the sixth grade and, and loved his work. And I, I went through a period where I, I think I read almost maybe everything he wrote, even books such as uh, Travels with Charlie and smaller novels uh, that are not as well known. But, so I think he was very important, and I loved what he did with that part of California. I mean, once again, I think a writer who's very interested in place, and I'm sure that influenced me. McCarthy came later. I didn't read him until I was in college, and I'd read Faulkner, so I saw Faulkner and McCarthy being, in a sense, very similar in the sense of just the high rhetoric, which is something that can be dangerous if, if, you, if you follow it too closely. I find that I, I have to be careful about not getting into that kind of high rhetoric. That's not me as a writer. But I, I, I just, uh, I love uh, McCarthy's uh, language, the intensity, uh, uh, and, and also something that I don't think people talk, talk enough about, and that is his ability to capture a dialect, dialogue, mm -hmm. impeccable. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I love about your novels that has hooked me as a reader is that there's always a crime or an element of crime central to each story. Uh, can you discuss the difference in your mind between crime fiction and literary fiction? And, and what are some of the choices that you make to reach a specific audience? Well, I think I, I would view it the way Flannery O'Connor did. People criticized O'Connor sometimes because there was such violence in her work, but she said that it, the reason, what, what violence allows us, that kind of situation, is that we in a sense, that's where when characters are revealed in, in the dramatic moment. Very often that moment in life is one where violence intrudes and, and so we get to the essence of character. And I think in serious fiction, the goal of violence is not to titillate, it's, it's to reveal character and to reveal the essence of a, of a, of a character and, and of a situation. At its heart, One Foot in Eden is very much a mystery. Can you talk a little bit about the care with which you took to reveal the clues or who the murderer was uh, in viewing the story from different characters' mm -hmm. points of view. Yeah. I wanted that novel to feel almost like a crossword puzzle, or not a crossword puzzle, maybe more as a jigsaw puzzle, where different pieces come in with different narrators. Mm -hmm. and, and my hope was that that slow revelation would make uh, more than just a whodunit, mm -hmm. or why, you know, why it was done. I hoped it would become something more than that. And, so, yeah, you know, my goal there was to reveal just enough to keep the reader curious, uh, guessing, and, and, and ultimately to, to come to that revelation of, of what has happened. How long did it take you to write One Foot in Eden? I think that book took about three years. 
three years. And uh, I've heard that Amy Rogers asked you to, to rewrite the ending to One Foot Needin. What was the original ending and which in your mind is better? Uh, Amy had talked to me about, as we, as we got toward the end, uh, that the, sher the sheriff drowns. And, and that just seemed like too much. And she was right about that. I think we needed the sheriff to survive. And it really set up, I think, something very important, the idea that the sheriff had been longing for a son and this young man who now, Isaac, who has no father, in a sense, that at the end of the story, at least something is salvaged. Hmm. How, do you, how do you take others' feedback? Now, you know, you've had a lot of success mm -hmm. here in the past few years. How do you, how do you take others' feedback uh, your editor's feedback, uh, writing group, if you have something like that, and apply it towards your uh, revision process? Well, I think the goal is that it's not about your own ego. It's about, is this going to make the book better? And, and, and anybody who can give me advice that makes the book better, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to. And I think just that, that ability or willingness to keep oneself open, but at the same time, you know, to be true, to your own vision. I mean, uh, another story that was interesting about One Foot in Eden was a pretty prominent, or very prominent publisher turned it down because the publisher wanted me to write it from a single point of view. And, and that's where I felt like that's wrong. That, that's going to destroy what I'm trying to do in this book. So I didn't do it. Interesting. In The World Made Straight, one of the things that impresses me as a reader is your focus on the working class, even dirt poor lives of, of Travis and Leonard. Why is it important to you? to represent folks like Travis and Leonard in your work? Well, because they're so often ignored not only in literature, but in real life, I think. Uh, it's kind of interesting when you look at the, 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 the young men and women who are, are dying in, in, the, in the war right now. They're all, almost all of them are coming from these towns and small towns, rural areas in, in the United States, not just the South. But, and, and, and I think those lives are worthy of, of being written about and acknowledged as well. Are they underrepresented in American fiction right now? I think not so much in the South. I think we've got a number of really fine writers who do deal with those. Uh, you know, Larry Brown, unfortunately, has, has died too young, but William Gay continues to do that. Tom Franklin, I mean, George Singleton. We've got, I think, a good number of writers in, in North Carolina uh, all around here who, who deal with those kind of characters. Yeah. How does being a father shape you as a writer? I think that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question because I was just talking to another writer about that, how, in a sense, I think I've, I've heard writers say, well, yeah, I shouldn't have children because that's going to hurt my writing or get in the way. But I think uh, what I found is that it enriches my life and allows me a wider understanding of, of what it means to be a human being. And now sometimes that's a very terrifying uh, part, too, because you're, you always have this great fear for your children. How did the publication of One Foot in Eden lead to the paperback rights being sold for the book? And where along the way did you sign with Marley Russoff and how is that connected? Well, made? It's, it's interesting that we're talking about that right here because Nancy Olson, who's, I don't know if Nancy's still around here today or not, but she was uh, the person that did that for me. She, uh, Marley Russoff, my, my agent, had, had been at Quail Ridge and, and Marley asked, well, can you show me a writer, a book by a writer I've never heard of <laughs> that you like? And Nancy uh, showed Marley one foot knee and gave her the hardback, which was from Novella. Mm -hmm. So that was a small, you know, small edition, I think a printing of like 3,500. And Marley read it on the plane and called me, but uh, my, uh, uh, all this happened because of, of Nancy Olson. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, we are here with Ron Rash. He's the author of Serena, uh, One Foot in Eden, Saints of the River, and The World Made Straight. We're talking a little bit about some of his writing process. I want to dig in a little bit with the state of Southern fiction, being a, a Southerner myself. I'm, I'm interested in your take on what the state of Southern fiction is today. I think it's, 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 it's as healthy as it's ever been. I, I, what I find interesting is that sometimes I don't think that's acknowledged outside the South as much as it should be. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think right now, North Carolina has more good writers than any other state in the country. I think that's obvious. And, Second would be Mississippi, probably. So I think we, we are dominating. And it's kind of interesting because I was, uh, One Foot in Eden came out in France recently and has done well. And, and I was talking to my French publisher, uh, and she said, well, I don't get it. Why, why are the Southern writers not <laughs> acknowledged in the Northeast of the United States? And I said, well, 
I don't, you know, that's one of the mysteries. Is it harder for them to, or for us to find a home with New York Publishing? You struggled for a lot of yeah. years before mm. breaking through, really. Yeah. Well, I, I, it, it took me a while, and I th but um, I don't know. I think sometimes it's interesting that there's this perception that you can write about New York City, and that's not regional, but if you write about a small town in North Carolina, it is. I mean, we all are writing about certain places. Uh, you have to set something somewhere. I mean, maybe in your own head, but usually... Uh, is there a difference, kind of though, between, you know, a, a rural story set in upstate New York and, and set in, you know, you know, Morganton, North Carolina, for example. Uh, not very often, very not, and and I would say even uh, a, a story set in in New York City. I mean, it's ultimately about what it means to be a human being. And I love Richard Price, who writes, I think, very beautifully and elegantly about New York City, and his characters. I, I certainly see as, in a sense, regional, in the sense that they, they are in a particular place, very often just a few blocks of New York City, but at the same time, universal. So I, I think we're, we're, you know, we're after the same thing. What is a, a young Southern writer, somebody watching this interview on, on YouTube or wherever it, it ends up, what does a young Southern writer have to do to shake things up and sort of reinvent the wheel? Is that something that yeah. somebody needs to do? Well, I, I agree. I mean, I don't think... <clears throat> I think there's always a danger that you fall into these kind of easy ca characterizations as a Southerner, kind of the cliched thing. But I think part of it is that the South has is, is obviously changed a good bit. I think uh, novels about the urban South are certainly significant. Uh, uh, novels that address newer problems, certainly uh, the changing cultural landscape, immigration, how that changes the South. All this, I, I think there, there will always be material here. I think. What is best, though, that I find that makes Southern literature so good is not just a, not so much landscape, but what's done with the language, the richness of the language. I mean, that's ultimately why I go back to Faulkner. It's not necessarily just to uh, to get a sense of what it's like to be in Mississippi. It's what he does with the language, and I feel that way with Flannery O'Connor. I feel that way with Cormac McCarthy. I feel that way with Lee Smith. I feel that way with Jill McCorkle, David Payne, on and on and on. Hmm. Well, what importance or value, you know, One Foot in Eden is is a historically set novel, although not, you know, you know, 200 years in the past or something. Uh -huh. Serena is a historically set novel. Uh, wh why is that important to you to set a novel? Uh, at some point in the past, mm -hmm. you know, more than 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Well, I think with Serena particularly, I felt like that was a, a better way to look at the present through the past because what I'm writing about, I mean, I wrote Serena because of what was happening uh, in, uh, a couple of years ago with environmental issues, particularly uh, it looked like there was going to be some really extensive logging in mm -hmm. national forest. It didn't quite happen uh, as badly as I thought it was going to happen. But it, certainly the threat was there, and so uh, part of I think part of what the historical fiction I love does is a comment on the present as much as the past. Hmm. Very cool. So, what does the future hold for you? What well, I've got a book, short projects? stories coming out in March, and and that, that's nice after writing for me. Uh, Serena is by far my longest novel, so it's nice to go back to something shorter. So that's uh, that's what uh, the, you know that'll be the next book out, and uh, I hope it does well. How does writing, how, how is writing a short story, how is the process of writing a short story, conceiving it, putting it on the page, how is that similar or different to the process of, of writing a novel? Uh, radically different. I, I tell my students, and I, and I believe this, that writing a short story is much closer to writing a poem than a novel. Mm -hmm. And I think of the three forms, poetry, short story, novel, short story is the hardest to do well. There's just no room for error. Right. I mean, in a sense, almost all the concision of poetry, yet at the same time, the sense of uh, narrative uh, that one gets out of a story, I mean, out of a novel. Thank you very much, Ron, for Thank speaking you. with us today. Yeah.